Wicked Problems in Children's Rights in Education, proudly presented by the Research and Children's Rights in Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's 8 a.m., 9 a.m. now in the UK. Uh, my name is Victor. I'm from the UK. I'm 16 years old, and I'm the representative of the Eurochild Children's Council. Uh, so uh, just to say a little bit about this, this is a panel on which 12 young people from all over Europe that focus on representing young people and advocating for children's rights and change, particularly about the participations of decisions that affect us. I'll be presenting my opinion during this uh, little five minute speech and that of many other young people about the shortcomings of the current education system. Moving on to the next slide, you'll see that my title is the flaws in our education system, the challenges that we see as young people. So moving on, some problems that can be found in different countries of Europe uh, being real challenges of the education system will be discussed today. However, some will be able to overlap into other education systems around the world. One of the biggest problems encountered in various education systems around the world is the constant pressure of children and young people having to robotically store information. How will memorizing a textbook help us acquire the skills we need? Memorization is not knowledge. We will forget everything we memorized because it was forced. You had to memorize to pass that exam, to get the grade you wanted so badly, but for what? In order to forget two months later what you focused so much on. It is useless because it does not become skill, it doesn't become knowledge, it doesn't become a life skill, something that, that that school is meant to teach you. It becomes something that you learn, use for a few days, and then completely altogether forget it. Moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is coming on to the second problem that I have chose to raise awareness about, really, in, which is the, the education system being closed and having a standardized approach that almost every school in the UK has, and I'm aware that some other schools in the world also have this approach, where schools are connected to think convergently with the school approach and say that there is only one correct answer, whether it is at the back of the textbook or at the back of the test. To get grades and marks and points, you have to get that one exact answer. You can't give another one. We that means we can't be creative. We can't do research when we're stuck because that would mean we're cheating. And therefore, the school system rewards the students that are able to, to comply with these rules, to fit in this small category that is initially and downright a restriction of how education could be. In, the comp in a company or a higher education, the world of work, whatever you want to look at this example, somebody is appreciated for a person who can work really well because he's able to collaborate to achieve the same goal. Um, in everyday life, if somebody doesn't know something and they say, look, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure, and they go back and they research or they try to look up the answer, they'll be praised because it shows resilience, confidence and creativity. But school teaches us to work, not so much of a team, but to be individualistic. It sort of contradicts what we're actually gonna be doing after we leave school. Have you ever thought about that? Moving on to the last defect that I've chosen to tackle is about young people being faced off education due to the competition between schools. The results in general, wherever that may be, grades, letters, um, numbers, they're very important and they're very important for the students themselves because it allows them to move forward. They're very important to the families. Um, however, the academic achievements of the students are most important due to the school because of the prestige that it brings to it. In my opinion, academic results should not be the most important and they should come naturally without students being under the pressure of exams or grades. Schools often have an impersonal system that focuses too little on the student as an individual. 
and rather takes a collective approach without taking in personality and individual characteristics and doesn't help them to get the highest grade. School must discover the true potential of students and teach them to collaborate, to be creative, to be confident in their own strength, to be unique, because each of us is unique and can have the best results without standardization and competition. There is no need to put this much pressure on children and young people. And to finish up, I would like to move on to the next slide and leave you with a quote that Albert Einstein once said. Whilst you read that quote, I will say something else. <laughs> so as a finish up, these are just a few of the examples that have been recognized by young people as flaws in the education system. During this period of COVID-19, the vision of life on things has changed so many in so many areas. Practically during this time, we have realized that time has stopped and that we cannot continue to go forward without analyzing, uh, realizing how many things should be reset, rethought and updated. We need to rethink education to successfully rethink our society. And as one last note, I would like to read out the quote that Albert Einstein once said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Thank you very much for listening to me. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights and Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. Thank you, Victor, for a really important start. I think many of us this week were really shocked at the death of Sir Ken Livingstone, and it's great to see young people like Victor picking up that mantle um, and arguing for the individual within the collective, which I think is also a really wicked problem for child rights and education. How do we protect that individual child? Um, I've decided to do something very general. Um, it's not particular to education, but I do think it's prevalent in education and I thought it might be useful to do that today. And that's to raise what I think are twin problems with child rights and education and generally, and that is child rights inflation and child rights dilution. And I'm going to start with child rights inflation. So if you don't mind the next slide. And I think, um, I mean, this is a debate that's happening in human rights more generally, but it's Nigel Cantwell, who many of you will know, who raised it first for me in the context of child rights. And Nigel is, as a drafter of the convention, one of the original drafters, very loyal to the text, has raised lots of issues about a deep concern about people taking the text of the convention and then um, making claims that do not exist within the actual text. Now, we have to recognise that all human rights treaties um, are dynamic and have to be interpreted teleologically. That means, you know, in, in the context and, and moving on. Um, but you still can't make up rights and you can't decide what you have. For Nigel, the one he argued against, which I disagree with him, is on collective participation. He thought that the right in the convention to be heard was only one of it for the individual child, not the collective. Now, I think that battle was lost by Nigel. The Committee on the Rights of the Child has moved on and said it does cover collective participation. But we do see other versions of this. We see things like claims that there's a right to love, that under Article 15 of the Convention, there's a right to socialise with your peers. And even now, a huge debate about whether there's a right of access to the internet. Now, none of those are in the Convention, and there's good reason why some of them aren't. Some of them, for me, for instance, socialising with peers and access to the internet may be incredibly important ways of realising other rights, like the right to play or the right to education, which we've seen right now through COVID, that many children cannot enjoy their right to education unless they have access to Wi-Fi and a device in which to you know, access their schooling. But they're not rights in themselves unless we choose, governments choose to make them rights. So rights inflation for me is one problem. The second and twin problem, if we move slides, um, Zoe, please, is rights dilution. <laughs> Wait, rights dilution I've written about, and I know I haven't a lot of time now, but there's an editorial in the International Journal of Children's Rights on that. But these are the kinds of things that I think are not rights, but are claimed as rights or are twinned with rights. The first is well-being. 
we often see child rights and child well-being. They're very different things and well-being, perhaps arguably more ambitious than a rights framework, does not have its legal base. It's a different thing. And putting them together, I think, dilutes our child rights approach. And we see it very, very often in education. I think these things come across because people are afraid to use human rights language because they meet with resistance to child rights and human rights language. And I'm going to come on to speak about why I think we should use the language that we have been given if we, if we want to work within this area. The second one way, and this is very um, prevalent in education, is that when we talk about child rights, we talk about rights and responsibilities. And often those responsibilities are um, said to be, uh, the rights are said to be contingent upon responsibility. And Harry Shear has written a really good article in the International Journal of Children's Rights exploring that. Uh, and again, I would argue it's a dilution that we're afraid to give children's rights unless we fire in a bunch of responsibilities. And Kennerstead, who you're going to hear from later, has written a, a wonderful article making the same point about the three Ps, participation, protection and provision. And she questions why we use this language and we don't use the normal human rights language of um, socioeconomic rights and civil and political rights. We wouldn't do that for adults. Why do we do it for children? And finally, um, Carl Hansen and I have written a paper about the four general principles. And again, we all talk about the four general principles, but what we see sometimes in education research is those four general principles being used as the whole of the convention, as opposed to cross-cutting provisions that mainly need to be attached to a substantive right, like Article 28 and Article 29, which are the rights to education. So those are my twin problems. I think on the one hand, we're inflating rights, and on the other hand, we're diluting rights because we're afraid of it. I don't think, if we move on to the next slide, I don't think that these things are unrelated. I actually think that what's happening is sometimes that when we overclaim, that we, we, we say that we have rights that do not actually exist, we impact our credibility. And that can re result in uh, resistance to us and actually damage to credibility. And then that can then have the consequence of, of people making a retreat, not using uh, rights language, using other things which they think are more palatable, more palatable maybe to journals, to funders, um, to government, to policymakers. So that's my wicked problem. And I'm worried about it. I think the um, solution is that we have got to look for legal accuracy so that we have credibility and um, clearly you know i see myself as an education researcher first and foremost although i am a lawyer this we have to get this right and it's not that hard to get right i think some of it stems from the fact that many of us see ourselves as researcher activists and when you become an activist you're an advocate and you're looking to to achieve something by whatever means but we're not we're academics and we can't we can't do that we have to be robust I really like the way Didier Renard et al have put it. They talk about us being critical proponents, critical proponents of children's rights, so that we, we acknowledge that uh, the convention and the other rights um, are important and powerful and have meaning, but they're not perfect. And we're prepared to say when they're not perfect. So my last message is that I would call on us to, as education researchers with an interest in children's rights, that we call out the inadequacies that we see and that we don't adorn and we don't adapt. Thank you very much. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights and Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. Hi, my name is Betsy. I'm 17 years old. I'm from Central Africa, precisely from Cameroon. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my story. For the past four years in Cameroon, precisely in the northwest and southwest regions of Cameroon, it hasn't really been very easy on the children in, the, in those regions. Why? Because of the Anglophone crisis. In that effect, many rights have been violated. The right to education, the right to shelter, the right to freedom, and very importantly, the right to live. And more and more are still being violated, still being yet violated. So due to this, these children turn to go to other parts of Africa, neighboring countries, in search of survivor. And why some 
flee and they go to the French speaking regions in search of education. I am an example of a child who left the Northwest region to the French speaking regions in search of education. And life hasn't been very easy for us here, for we, the children of the Anglophone regions here and the Francophone speaking regions. And for parents who do not have money to send their children to the French speaking regions for education, they live at in the Northwest region, in the Anglophone crisis, because their parents can't afford for their education. So I'm going to share a story. Uh, I'm going to give some few challenges that we face in the French region when uh, in search of our education. The first challenge that we face is getting an admission into high school. In my current high school, before I got my admission, it wasn't easy. I was very expensive on the side of my mom as a single mother with three children. She had to pay for a huge sum of money for me to have my name registered on the class list, a huge sum of money for, for registration, and a huge sum of money before I could, uh, for school fees. And after, even after this, I was still being tormented in class time and again because my name still didn't appear on the class list. So it's very, very traumatizing. While you're in class, um, lectures are going on, you have to go outside being called by the administrator or somebody from school once in a while to ask why haven't you paid this? Why haven't you paid that? Your name is not on the class list. And even during examination periods, some children get disturbed in class because of that. So that is one of the challenges that we face. The second one is getting a comfortable place to stay. You have the admission now. Where are you going to stay? Because the costs of the house rent are very expensive. And getting a comfortable place is very difficult. So in this, you see, you tend to see five to six children staying in the same bedroom because they don't have money. They cannot afford to pay for a, a single rooms for each of them. And also, the cost of feeding is so expensive. The cost of food and water, everything. You buy everything that you use. Yes, it's so expensive. And in this, it's, it, it's like as we come and you have an English-speaking English region, the prices just got skyrocketed. But before all this happened, the issue of the rights of education in Africa, precisely in Africa, has been a problem. Like, for example, we can take, for example, Sudan, Mali, and Nigeria. We can see that if we look at these countries closely, you will see that um, the rights of education are yet violated. And especially the rights of education to the girl child. Um, for example, in Sudan, we know that the cause, one of the causes of children not going to school is due to uh, poverty. But in a place like Mali, we see, there are still people, some areas in Mali, where those parents still have that primitive idea of not educating their girl children because she is going to be better than her husband. And also in a place like Nigeria, you have school phobia. It could still be a cause. Why? Because children in Nigeria, especially in the interior parts of Nigeria, are yet kidnapped day by day because of from Boko Haram, especially the girl children who go to school. They get kidnapped by uh, uh, by the Boko Haram, uh, um, uh, uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria. So this has really been a cause. It's something to talk about. And in other areas of the world, you have places like Afghanistan. You have places like India where the rights of education yeah, is still a problem, it's still, it's still an issue. So uh, my wish for education is I just want to study free. I just need a peaceful place to, to study. And I made all these things true, not because I was too tough or because I'm from a very wealthy background. No, it's just because by the grace of God and because I have a kind of, I have a mom, a strong mom who thinks and who strongly believes that her children should be educated no matter the odds. I am lucky to have that mom, but not all children. A privilege to have such parents. So I think the first thing we should be targeting in order to make children go to school should be their backgrounds from where they come from. We should look at their backgrounds, look at the parents. Do they still have that mentality, that primitive mentality of not sending their children to school? Is it poverty? So there are so many causes why, uh, there are so many causes that I think why children do not go to school. And sometimes it could be phobia. A child may decide not to go to school because of a particular distress in the family or a particular fear of a particular aspect. Is it the teacher, the way the teacher teaches? So there are so many causes. And so I think that if we examine these causes better and we look for relevant ways in how to solve this, um, many children will go to school. Statistics show that about 700 million children today in the world are still illiterate. They can't read nor write. Now, as I earlier on said, look at Sudan. Look at the poverty rate in Sudan. So it's really something that we need to work on. 
and also I'll, my wish is just to go to school in peace and I wish that other children like me can be able to go to school. If we can open homes, we can be able to give to the poor, we can be able to pick up children from the streets and send them to school. It will be very good. And if we can be able to talk to our schools and our administrations for the issue of bribery and corruption, it will be very, very good. So thank you very much for listening to my video. My name is Betsy. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights and Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. Good. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights and Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. Good morning, everybody. I'm Samson Oladejo, I'm a PhD student at the University of West of Scotland, and I'll be speaking briefly for five minutes on the wicked problems and the future direction for children's rights in education. And I will just give a brief uh, de description or definition of a uh, wicked problem in the context of education, that there are issues in education so complex and dependent on so many factors. They are fundamentally novel and complex very hard to solve, but they are not impossible. They may be hard to solve, but they are, they are not impossible. They also resist solutions sometimes and have no stopping rules. And I want us to know that um, solution to wicked problems, they are not a true or false. They can only be good or bad if you are able to solve the problem. And um, they could be system systemic or human. So, for example, if a, uh, children are denied access to education, that is a wicked problem. Or when they are restricted from educational activities, that is also, also a wicked problem. And um, I will give some specific example. UN Convention on Children's Rights uh, recognizes uh, education as right of every child. But you, we see increasing number of out of school children, especially in the, low, in the developing countries, increasing every year. That is also a wicked problem. The challenge of technology to meet the children's educational needs is also uh, a wicked problem. They, we, I can go on and on. Even the impact of COVID-19 on children's right to education is a wicked problem. There are children who want to learn, but they are forced out of school. Some of them, their parents don't have uh, knowledge or the training that they can use to train them at home to on, on, on online uh, work that their teacher allocated to them. That's a, a wicked problem because they have been denied access to education. So what of children who are in poverty, facing barriers to access to education? That's another wicked problem. So is this, uh, wicked problems in education, they are, uh, they are many. They are in, in so many countries, of Africa, you see children who are out of school. Those are children, uh, a wicked problem. Even underfunding schools, when school is underfunded, that is another wicked problem. Overcrowding, overcrowding in schools, you see many children in classes, they cannot learn effectively. That's another wicked problem. What of teach, teachers who are untrained and they are allocated to teach these students? That is a wicked problem. We have a lot of wicked problems. What of clim climate change? Climate change, the complexity of climate change and the uncertainties of climate change affect children's right to education in so many ways that we cannot even fathom. I want to leave that. I want to give a specific example. There is a, 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 um, a research that I, I undertook in Nigeria last year, and the research is still undergoing anyway. It's, a, it's like a two year research. And Despite the fact that Nigeria is a signatory to UN Convention on uh, Children's Right to Education, Nigeria has the highest number of children, out of school children in the whole world. Ten, over 10.5 Nigerian students are not in the education. What could be more wicked than that? I'll come again. Nigeria, of course, the government has made some practical effort to make sure these children are in school. For example, in, uh, universal basic education was introduced in, two, in 1999. 
over 30 years after the introduction, many Nigeria students, millions of Nigeria students are still not in education. That is a wicked problem. And um, of course, they did their own, there are laws. Laws were established to sanction even parents that, those, that refused to take their children to school. Yet, the problem persists. No clear solution in sight. That is a wicked problem. And I can go all and on, all and on and on to name how this affects children, millions of children. One of the children that we that took part in our investigation or in our research has this to say. I quote him: "I dropped out of school for lack of finance, not because I wanted to. I desperately desired to be in education. Whenever I see my friends going to school, I cried and always feel very sad." I know one day, by God's grace, I will also go back to school. Can you, can you imagine a child crying because he cannot be in education, because his parents cannot sponsor him? That is a wicked problem. Each child is a bearer of education rights, or the right to education is a right of every child, not a privilege. And the society is obliged to fulfill this right in and through education. This right requires more than legal support. It's a moral and imperative and must be manifested at all levels of the society. Everybody is involved. Children, irrespective of background, age, color, religion, or beliefs, should be given the opportunity, the right, the environment, right environment, and be supported to discover, develop, and maximize their potentials in a conducive academic setting. They can only be children for once in their lifetime because they have one life to live. So therefore, education is the responsibility of all, which we have to make sure they have. I want to give the uh, future direction because of time. The future of children's rights need to be built or we need to build upon the UN Convention of 1989 by revising, reforming, innovating policy that deal with the right or strengthen the rights and implementation of this mechanism. And in this direction, we need to concentrate on the neglected children, the groups of children that are neglected, especially children from poor families who don't have access to education due to one reason or the other. Then another future direction is training for teachers, for students and parents to facilitate online learning. So therefore, government, researchers, educationists, educators, we need to invest in educational, in ICT, so that children can have, can be supported effectively for online teaching or online learning. Pragmatic research in this direction drawing on latest technology to improve access and collaboration with key stakeholders is very, very important. So I will say one thing once again, I know that it is a great economic burden, but this must be done. The right of children to education must be restored by investing massively in education. Thank you very much. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights in Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. I think some of the most wicked problems that children face in education come from adults, in particular from their parents and teachers' views, attitudes and assumptions. Children are not able to design their own education system. Adults design our education system and we live in it. Children have a voice, but for most children, their voices in education might as well be the voice of their parents and teachers, because most children grow up believing what their parents and teachers believe and valuing what their parents and teachers value. This is how prejudice is passed down the generations. I've picked two issues that are important to me to highlight this. The issues are different, but the connection to attitudes and assumptions of parents and teachers is the same. Um, 
My first issue is the segregation of students with disabilities. Could you please go to the second slide? Thank you. I have a little brother with uh, Julius. He has Down syndrome. So I pay attention to how students with disability, particularly intellectual disability, are accepted and treated in schools. Julius is lucky. He is the first child to attend his school, a local regular primary school, in its more than 80 year history. He has a great bunch of friends and is included in all subjects and activities with adjustments, including support from his teachers and assistants. But many parents and teachers believe that children like my brother should be in special schools or special units or special classrooms. Why? Because even though the research shows that students with disabilities do best academically and socially when they're learning with their non-disabled peers, many teachers and even parents have grown up with the historical assumption that children with disabilities need to be in special classrooms with other special children so they can get special help from special teachers. Special is just a nice way of avoiding what is really happening to children with disabilities, segregation. And we know that segregation never results in equal opportunities. That's why people are segregated, so that they do not have the same experience and opportunities as everyone else. Even though placing children with disabilities in special places may be intended to give them more support. For students with disabilities, segregation actually means reduced opportunities low expectations and denying them benefits of the learning with their non-disabled peers. Children do not naturally grow up thinking that the other children with disabilities should go to school somewhere else. If children were shipwrecked on an island, they wouldn't build a school with a special classroom for their disabled peers, rather they would naturally include all their peers. Segregation of students with disabilities is discriminatory and a denial of their human right to an inclusive education. My second issue is ability streaming and labeling students. Can we please have the next slide? Thank you. A similar issue is ability streaming. Many parents and teachers think that it is a smart idea that to put students who are smart in, um, in, a diff in a classroom with students who are smart like them. This is a common and logical assumption. So in countries like Australia, the pressure starts early in primary school to be the top in, the ma in, your, in your math class, to be the best in your spelling group and et cetera. By high school, the best students are separated into gifted and talented programs, provi provided with the best teachers, the most opportunities and high expectations. This is also a form of segregation, but it results in reduced opportunities and lower expectations for the remaining majority of students. In Australia, most students in the gifted and talented programs come from the most affluent and educated families. Many are tutored outside of school for many years so that they can qualify. These programs operate to maintain privilege. Labeling students as gifted, average or special just provides a basis for prejudice and stereotypes to thrive. These labels dictate levels of, res uh, levels of resources and teachers and student expectations. It creates division and a pecking order among students where no such division is justified. Further, Research evidence suggests that ability streaming does not improve academic results, and it certainly doesn't improve social outcomes such as leadership, tolerance, and empathy. Rather, the research suggests that ability streaming actually reduces academic outcomes and esteem ac across a whole student group. Ability streaming is driven by parents and teachers. It is not evidence-based and also denies the benefit of a truly inclusive education where all students learn together from each other with equality of opportunities and equal equality of expectations. For many students, the pressure to qualify for ability streaming also denies them a genuine and healthy childhood. Segregation of students within the education system conditions us to accept that segregation of people in their adult lives. The only way to break the segregation cycle to stop our schooling systems so that future generations will realize that their human right to an inclusive education and consequently to inclusive workplaces, inclusive communities, and generally to an inclusive life. Thank you. is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights in Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association.
First, I'm very proud and honored to be here and share this panel uh, with many experts and children and people. And I'm very happy that Laura and Victor set the foundation for my presentation now. So when Victor said something education is about sharing power and looking for innovative mechanism to share this power. And Laura talking about how we can give a voice to children within the school system and as well how we address segregation. That key principles is about education and the child rights uh, to participate and, and rights in general under the convention. So they give me a very good um, entry points. Um, I'm going to talk about the tensions between the uh, aims of education, the child rights to participate, and how these merge in a very complicated and problematic structure like the school. You know? So I'm, I'm going to talk about these three global policy documents. Um, I know that many people maybe are not familiar with this. So one is the Convention of the Rights of the Child. This, that's a human right treaty. The second one is a general comment number one on the aims of education and general comment 12 on the right to be listened to. Just in case you don't know what's a general comment, it's a global policy document developed by the Committee on the Rights of the Child to explain the concept outlined in the convention and give general information and guidance how to apply this. Now, in, in terms of the right to education, so it's clear the convention say that the right to education is not just about access, it's about content. So that's a critical element. And contra the contents, we say in Article 19 of the convention that the education should aim to develop a respect to human rights and enhance sense of dignity and improve the socialization and interaction of children with others but as well with the environment. So immediately that set the education system in different way. It's not just about learning subjects that are requirement to pass all um, from one grade to other. It's about learning how to become a better human being. As well, the Article 19 says that education needs to be child-centered, needs to be child-friendly, needs to be empowering. I'm sure you immediately start thinking, no, my school didn't happen. At my age, when I was in high school, in the school, these three elements never was there. After the convention, many things have changed, but still, um, I don't see that too much. But I want to take the empower element, because that will link our discussion to the, the right to participate. Okay, in terms of empowering, the general common one and on the aims of education say when the education empowers children, help children to develop a number of skills, social skills, life skills, like a curriculum of life, like I was mentioned by Victor. Second is learning about many of the capacities, how we resolve conflict, with how we understand human rights, how we support others, a sense of solidarity, etc. It's about as well about human dignity and about how we develop our own self-esteem and self-confidence. Now, taking these elements are very critical to understand participation. So now I want to talk about the right to participate. That is one of the core principles of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. It's mentioned specifically in Article 12, but there are a number of other articles in terms of participation. Is the right, the right that children have to be listened to, but to express ideas freely and matters that are relevant to them. Yeah? Express ideas freely and matters that are relevant to children. But these have a limited understanding. So then the general comment 12 and parties and they say the participation is an ongoing process, means ongoing, it's a permanent process, not just one event. Second, include information sharing, dialogue between children and adults based on mutual respect. So there are many key elements that are very important when we talk about participation. First, it's a process and outcome. So it's a long process with many phases, but as well have outcomes, have results in the end. Second is a mutual respect between adults and children. So we are talking about putting children and young people uh, as equitable partners with adults in terms of decision making. 
which is very problematic for not for children for adults it's a joint process as well it's a joint learning process not just one side learning is both adults learn from children learn children learn from adults now what is the tension what is problematic the implementation of this participation right but first myself i position uh, within the childhood studies and many uh, scholar here in the call as well they have the same position so we say children are child rights holders so they are humans with human rights definitely that is a very important position second we see children as a competent social actors who are able to make decisions who are able to interact with others to make something happen to change something in their life but then when it comes to school do you think these situations happen do you think a school teacher or any educational staff have the same understanding of children as a human um, beings fully competent to make decisions if that is one of the major problematic we are not talking about children replacing adults is how children go together with adults and how we make decisions together and how we have a joint learning okay there are four elements of the participation that i would like to highlight to see how this works one if when we unpack the, the definition they say first children have opportunity to form a view and this view are free i would say yes that normally children young people have the right to form a view but remember to form a view is something individual even you don't need to com communicate this view it's a more individual process it can be collective but the right to express an opinion is more collective and that normally is restricted because the opinions can be expressed in the school system but within the school system policy ideology or the spaces that normally are very controlled by the educational staff so that is one thing the second element children views are respected are taken seriously if that is another thing form a view or to have a view is very different that that view have been respected and the, the, the next one is how children inform decision making processes and the idea of decision making processes is something far for the interests of the adults the adults say they need to make a decision on children's life because they know what's the best for children but children have many things to say about that if that process has been very difficult and the last one in, in terms of how children can influence decision making and how they see the results of that participation another big limitation of the right to participate normally they are not feedback mechanisms children don't know how the ideas have been used and even sometimes the ideas have been used but they have no they don't know how so this create a lot of resistance and issues between the right to participate, the aim of this education that create new skills, thinking and, um, and empower human beings, they have a lot of capacities. Now, what is the three point, point of tensions? It does make very difficult to achieve uh, the right to participate. One is the power is the power of adults they don't want to lose the power of the children and victor mentioned this sharing power is kind of very difficult yeah i can say not just between children and adults it's about adults themselves power of men over women rich over poor white over black straight over lgbti etc always is an issue of power one group try to dominate the other one the second is the inequalities, if that was mentioned by Laura about segregation, inequality show who is included, who is excluded. If the education system excludes many children, after how many children even are out of the educational system, when they are in the education system as well, children suffer inequalities and marginalization, if that limits the right to participate in the decision making process. And the last one is the tensions between different rights, the non-discrimination right, the right to guidance, the right to be the best interest of the child. They can be used both to limit the right to participate. So in order to conclude this conversation today, I would say, if we want to think about the future of direction for children's 
rights and education, we need to bring together elements of the aims of, the, of education. It's about content, not just about the subject. It's about all the contents, like a personal developing, empowerment, etc. Second, we need to bring the participation right and how we can address the issues of power inequality. Thank you so much. Happy to take any questions by the end of this section. And again, thank you so much for this um, conference. It's great to see global academics sharing the same uh, floor with children and young people from many countries. So I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you, Zoe. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights and Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm from Child's Rights Connect, the Children's Advisory Team, which is a group of 12 people internationally that um, work to protect ch uh, children's rights. Um, I've also started my own nonprofit organization in Cape Town, South Africa, and we specifically focus on early childhood development and the environment. Um, in terms of education, I think one of the most, the most important factors is the, the ECD phase, the early childhood development, which is considered from the age of birth until roughly six years old. And this really is important because this is the basis on which not only your school career is built, but your life. Um, what you develop in this stage is what you then grow on from and what you can make more of. So this includes your physical development, your mental de development, emotional and all of that. And uh, this is really crucial for um, specifically in my country, I feel, in the example that children who don't get early childhood development um, care or go to preschools often show up to public schools and are expected to perform as well as a normal student would, um, which would be impossible because they haven't been able to develop the cognitive skills and the, um, the physical skills that they need to in order to do simple math or even uh, follow words on a page correctly. So this creates a lot of stress on the child and can actually create more uh, mental health issues further on not only in primary school phase, but later on in, the, in their school career as well. And one of the biggest problems we're facing with this in South Africa is the, the disregard or negligence for the early child development stage. Um, actually, our Department of Education has recently announced that with uh, a loan they have taken during the COVID-19 pandemic, they have um, decided to donate $77 million towards um, the restoration of early childhood development centers, um, but not by actively trying to rebuild them or keep them in, in business, but rather to pay people to, uh, to part-time employ people to walk around the country to see that these centers are, develop, uh, are working the way they should. Whereas this money should be invested into the schools themselves in order for them for the children to get the right necessary tools they need in order to develop their early childhood development whether this be as simple as a pair of scissors to cut paper so they can build their fine motor skills um, it would be a lot more effective than um, officials walking around and potentially closing down a lot of the early childhood development centers because they don't fit up to government standards um, and as a result of this, they expect that about 30,000 uh, preschools could be shut down and about 1 million children could be affected and potentially out of all uh, connection to an early childhood development center. Um, yeah, so not only is this a problem for children, but also a problem for women in our community because it's very big in South Africa for, uh, we call them a gogo, or a, a granny who make their own um, informal early child development center or daycare in their own houses in which parents drop their children off. And this creates income for these, these women and also 
pr uh, protects these children from different vulnerabilities they could face in the informal set settlements in which they live. A lot of the time parents are expected to go to uh, work in town and can be gone for as long as 12 hours a day and children um, can't be left at home alone due to the different crimes in South Africa and the vulnerabilities they face. So early childhood development centers also uh, pose as a safeguard for them. And the fact that they, they might be closing down now is a real issue. Uh, yeah, so not only is it to develop them educationally and physically so they can bear the tasks that are expected of them in normal school, in primary school, and the mental health issues that come along later that they need to adapt to, but also for their own safety in that moment. Thank you so much for having me. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights and Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. So what I want to focus on, uh, the task that was given us as panelists was to think about wicked problems for children's rights in education. And for me, I think a key wicked problem has to do with the impact of children's rights education for children's rights in education. Uh, often we have seen, since very early on, that there has been a fragmentation of the outcomes we expect when we think about children's rights education. We expect knowledge, we expect skills, we expect a change of attitudes, and the whole field, in a way, moved in these different fragments. And my sense is that we have lost the, and we, we're not able to see the forest and we're just focusing on the trees. And what happens is that we have these finite concrete changes that we are pursuing when we uh, implement children's rights education programs or initiatives, uh, instead of trying to think about a larger impact, a long lasting impact, a broader effect of uh, teaching children about their rights and actually empower them, as Patricia was saying, empower them to exercise their rights, claim their rights. So uh, for me, I think when we think about impact, it has to be with two concrete things. One is children having the legal literacy, so knowing their rights, knowing that the children's rights are legal claims that they can make. And part of the legal literacy is being able to go to the right channels and use the right mechanisms to exercise those rights. And the other one is political participation. So what they can do in the political landscape when their rights are not respected, beyond the legal, the political together. This is way beyond knowledge of the convention or uh, positive attitudes toward conventions. This uh, more broad approach to what we want to have and the impact we want to have in children's rights education has uh, clear implications for all of us, researchers, practitioners, uh, I don't want to say child uh, activist, but also uh, child rights activist uh, at large. And why do I think this is a wicked problem? Well, it has multiple causes. None of them are clear. Part is clearly the fragmentation that we were saying, but also the complexity of teaching and learning. Uh, teaching and learning any subject, we know it comes with its own difficulties and its own challenges. But there are other fields that have slowly and steadily developed their own pedagogical knowledge and a body that helps practitioners and helps educators to navigate the complexity of teaching and learning a specific subjects. I do think that more work needs to be done to develop a pedagogical knowledge on children's rights and how better, uh, how, what is a better approach to teach children's rights for different ages at different groups in different contexts and so on. There's also a lack of structures and spaces to teach children about their rights. If you think about the curriculum, if you think about textbooks, if you think about programs, 
there are not many spaces in which children can successfully engage in knowing their rights, thinking how their rights impact their whole lives, thinking how they can have uh, their rights uh, better protected in their schools, in their families, and so on. So we need better spaces and we need better structures. But as Samson uh, correctly indicated in the previous panel was, there is no a single solution to a weak problem. So we cannot, uh, with just one approach, sort out these uh, very limited, very limited impact of children's rights education so far. So we definitely need more research. We need more research on what works and what doesn't work when we when talk about children's rights education. We need, uh, we need to rethink how we can come up with more uh, participatory approaches for children's rights education within the curriculum, within the classroom, within the school structures, and not looking at children's rights education as an add-on that happens outside school, that happens with the help of NGOs and other organizations, but something that can also happen within the school's uh, structures, within the classroom, within the curriculum. Another uh, solution that we might need to think about how we implement is how we create these spaces and these structures. Uh, COVID-19 has shown that there's a lot of potential in digital technologies and how these can be helpful to all of us know more about any sorts of things. So how, can, how are we rethinking the role of digital technologies for uh, letting children know about their rights beyond just knowing the convention of the rights of, their, of the child, but knowing how to use it and have the literacy, the capacity to protect their rights and make sure that others always, uh, other, other children also have the rights protected. So uh, the wicked problem, I think it's how, how we think about impact when we think about children's rights education. And if we want to have a broader impact, if we claim that children's rights education must be transformational, must empower children, must help them participate, then that has clear consequences and that has clear demands for researchers, for academics and for adults. I think Laura from uh, the previous panel said it quite uh, gloriously that most of the problems with children's rights come from adults and our adults' points of view and how we, instead of enable children to exercise their rights, we create more barriers. So how, as adults, we start dismantling those barriers and setting better structures for children to have a better experience in education. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights in Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. My name is Savannah. I'm 11 years old and I live in the UK. I want to talk today about what it's like for me to learn during the lockdown. First of all, a bit about me. I'm the kind of person who loves to learn new things I strive to do well and I'm currently in my last year of primary school, which means I start senior school in September. The school I'm going to is considered one of the best grammar schools in our city. You don't have to pay to go there, but you do have to sit in entrance exam and they only pick the students with the highest marks across the city. This is a very competitive ex entrance exam. I sat my exam before the pandemic outbreak and was over the moon to be offered a place. Then COVID-19 happened. Since lockdown, all our learning has been done online at home. I want to talk about three key issues. One, structure and communication. Two, not being able to learn new things. And three, technology issues. Firstly, I really do wish we had more communication with our teachers. We did not have any live lessons and video calls. We only had emails through our website. I would have preferred to learn in a more interactive way. 
Also, seeing a teacher online would have made me feel more motivated and cared for by the education system. I think we should have been asked to put our uniforms on at the start of the day, as this completely changed your mindset and helped you to be motivated and focused. I think we should have seen our teachers at the start of the day for a registration and given a timetable to follow, as you would in school. As it was, we were just sent tasks to complete, which meant it was too easy just to play on our phones or watch TV and lose interest in our work. Also, if you have more live lessons, it would be a way to have a connection with our classmates, rather than feeling so isolated. Secondly, I felt really frustrated that we were not taught any new material. I found the work set too easy and therefore boring. I asked the teacher if I could learn algebra as I wanted to feel prepared for senior school, but we just went over old work that I could already do. This means I feel more anxious about starting senior school. Finally, there were lots of technology barriers to learning at home. Often the website did not work and would take over an hour to load work. My brother and I sometimes had to share a tablet, which means we could not work simultaneously. Because I believe that there will be further lockdowns and this won't be the only time that we have to learn at home during the school term, I would like to recommend I'd like my recommendations to be considered in a future lockdown. I think there should be a system where every child is allocated a tablet or an appropriate device to work on from, from their school. This could be a loan item that they have to return to the school. At the moment there are government schemes for disadvantaged families. But these systems are not easy to access and most families that need a device to work on would not be classified as in need which still leaves many children struggling. Two, I think teachers should be more available for live leadership. Many parents have to work at home to have to work at home too and this would mean that they have to get on with their work whilst the children could be supported by their teachers. Three, I think teachers should be asked to wear children should be asked to wear their uniform and register together at the start of the school day and given a clear timetable to follow with some live teaching sessions in each day. I understand that it's not healthy to sit in front of a screen for a long too long, but I do feel interactive leadership from a teacher would really help. Finally, I also feel that more students are capable and should be given the resources to learn new material and maintain their interest in their education. Thank you so much for listening and supporting me to be part of this important conference. Thank you. Good morning to all. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights in Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association. Let me quickly thank the organizers for the refreshing and wicked format which I had never heard about. Also a shout out to our fellow presenters. And again, to hello to all, two more to go. I have decided to break loose and to be provocative at first. Please don't worry too much because I will qualify my initial statement when concluding. So here it is. I wonder if human rights education and in particular child rights education aimed at children whether it is a complete waste of time and money. Let's jump into the issue with a surprise detour. Perhaps you remember the 1999 Columbine High School massacre in Colorado. Two students killed 11 fellow students and then committed suicide. Make sure to see the masterful documentary Bowling for Columbine in which Michael Moore investigates what on earth could bring two adolescents to commit such a sordid act. For now, let me recount a brief segment during which Moore asks a very serious looking man, how is it possible that two kids from a middle-class neighbor neighborhood carried out such a massacre? And as I recall, the person answers that it is indeed baffling to him how such aggression could emerge in his love thy neighbor and church going community. The thing is that while he is answering, 
on the floor of the factory where he works. In the background, a huge rocket missile slowly appears and cro crosses the stream, the, the screen, sorry. So as spectators, we are led to believe that one cannot disconnect the individual violence of the two mass murderers from the controlled aggression that permeates the community and is manufactured for war in their backyard. Sure, you can focus on the behavior of the two adolescents, guilty, no doubt, but you also have to take into account a much broader social and political context and to look through the lens of an ecological model. Now, many of you are probably like me, starry-eyed idealists that believe in the positive effects of promoting child rights education. Heck, that's what the human rights agenda calls for, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Convention, in particular Article 29, the um, general comment on the aims of education. So content, process, and purpose. Child rights education refers to the content, the principles, respect, dignity, non-discrimination, participation, etc. But it also refers to process. Who carries out the education? Teachers and NGOs. What is their degree of training, their belief system, and their ideology? And what is the purpose of child rights education? Of course, to enhance society's convivienza, our living together through making sure children know about their rights and those of others. Children become more engaged, adopt responsible and nonviolent citizenship values and behaviors. And there's a lot of qualitative research that suggests that it works to some extent, but only under the best of circumstances, when all the planets are aligned in countries that have a well-funded educational system, rights-oriented uh, policies, well-paid teachers trained in child rights who dispense their knowledge via specific curricula, but with significant on autonomy nonetheless, and when child participation is valued, and when there is no corruption in the school. No corruption. The Committee on the Rights of the Child meets with children from the countries that are up for review regarding the implementation of the convention. Early this year, we met with a young adolescent girl from a rural area of a, a country I won't uh, name, a poor country. We asked her a few questions, one of which was the extent of digital education in her school. Oh, yes, she said. The school has received several computers from the state. The only problem is that the teachers stole them all. And by the way, she added, girls in her school feel, uh, feared being sexually abused by their male teachers. So where does one start? Classes on human rights, on children's rights? Or does the human rights agenda start with a better selection of teachers, enhanced safety for the children? Oh yes, we also heard from another country that it could afford to increase the military budget, but not the education budget. So teachers would continue to be on strike or not report to work or be poorly motivated. So to conclude, with very few exceptions, just a handful of countries, just a, hand, just a handful of countries, school does not necessarily promote child and human rights even when there is a curriculum. Actually, in most of the world, children attend schools that are a reflection of a corrupt social and political structure. So let's not kid ourselves. We must systematically improve our adult, our very own adult environment to make a real impact with child rights education. That comes first, but I'm just like you. Let's continue the way we do it because some of it will probably have a positive impact and it may stick a little bit and it makes us feel good and perhaps a little less wicked. Thank you very much. This extract is proudly brought to you by the Research on Children's Rights and Education Network as part of the European Educational Research Association.
So the wicked problem that I wish to address today is how teachers are positioned in relation to children's rights work in educational settings. The immensely central role that teachers play with regard to children's rights is well known. Teachers are vital for the establishment of a respectful children's rights culture and they are even more crucial for providing children's human rights education. So teachers are key in these endeavor, endeavors. I, I think we can all agree on that. Because of their importance, teachers have been the object of much educational children's rights research. Their attitudes to children uh, having rights um, have been explored. Their knowledge about rights have been investigated and their actions in practice have been examined. The results of the lion part of these studies are discouraging. Numerous studies have found teachers to be partly hesitant to the very idea that children have full human rights. Teachers' insufficient knowledge about rights have been demonstrated in many studies. Teachers' concrete actions in classrooms have been shown to often be counter to a rights-informed culture. In short, teachers have been identified as a problem, a large one. This, I believe, is a wicked problem. On the one hand, the picture isn't a misrepresentation. It does illuminate a troublesome matter that we need to be aware of. But on the other hand, positioning teachers as villains risks alienating teachers from engagement in human rights for children. I have more and more come to believe that we have reached the end of this road. It doesn't lead anywhere to keep pointing out the shortcomings of teachers. We have now a good research-based idea about what the main issues are that need to be dealt with. And I think that it is now time to embark on a new approach. So what, what then could be a future direction to handle this problem? First, I think that why questions need to be put in the center of attention. Why don't teachers have enough knowledge? Why do children's rights opposing attitudes linger in preschools and schools, affecting student treatment and classroom practice? Such why questions lead the research interest to, to teacher education, to education policy and school governance on both national local and school levels, and to larger societal discourses. Teachers' thinking, knowledge and actions should be more intensely reflected against the prerequisite they are given for the work. So a first future direction, I think, is to turn the focus away from teachers' shortcomings and towards the conditions for their children's right work. Second, I think that it is necessary to explicitly approach teachers as professionals. Teachers are generally well educated and have a solid experience of working with children and young people. They have accordingly a both theoretically and practice-based professional competence to meet students and to plan and undertake education. Despite this, it seems more common to turn to outside actors, such as NGOs, than to the teachers themselves for coming up with ideas for how to strengthen children's rights in school culture and how to carry out education about human rights for children and young people. In my view, teachers are currently being deprofessionalized in relation to children's human rights. So a second future direction in educational children's rights research uh, is therefore to professionalize teachers and to work with them, thereby combining researchers' expertise with the expertise of teachers. To sum up, I have argued that the positioning of teachers as villains is a wicked problem. It is not a complete misrepresentation, but it is counterproductive. I have suggested two possible future directions to deal with this, more attention to the framing of teachers' work 
and acknowledging teachers as professionals also in the area of children's rights. Thank you. <laughs>